Hello and welcome. We reached the penultimate episode of the series that seeks to compare the actions of ISIS to Islamic doctrine. This episode will look into the fact that Islamic State kills more Muslims, especially those from religious minorities like Shia Muslims, than they kill non-Muslims. I think a lot of Muslims and apologists for Islam who seek to distance the horrors of ISIS from Islamic doctrine quickly bring up this point. They feel that this somehow means Islam is innocent from everything else ISIS does, which I've already covered in detail so far. Now, this video will look at the Quran, the tafsirs, the hadiths, the history of Islam when inter-Muslim fighting occurred shortly after Muhammad's death, and the opinions of the major schools of jurisprudence on the issue. So this will be a somewhat lengthy video. It should provide lots of insight, especially near the end where I start to look at Islam's bloody history. You can skip to that particular section by clicking on the time you see on the screen right now, or scrolling through to that time if you're on a mobile device. But for those who don't want to get bogged down by the details of that or any other part of this video and want to skip all the way to the summary of the video at the end, click on the time you see on screen right now, or just scroll to that time to get there. So let's begin. In the Quran we have a whole chapter, number 63, dedicated to hypocrites. Hypocrites are described as being Muslim in name, but hiding sinister motives. Chapter 63 verse number 1 reads, When the hypocrites come to you, they say, We bear witness that you are most surely Allah's messenger. And Allah knows that you are most surely his messenger. And Allah bears witness that the hypocrites are surely liars. In another place, namely chapter 4 verse 145, the Quran says the hypocrites will receive the worst place in hellfire. Surely the hypocrites are in the lowest stage of the fire, and you shall not find a helper for them. So with paranoid rhetoric like that in the Quran that states that there is an enemy lurking within, is it any wonder Muslims begin to look for those hypocrites? The common argument is that Muslims are banned from fighting each other, but the Quran speaks about how Muslims fighting should be dealt with in chapter 49 verse 9. And if two parties of believers fall to fighting, then make peace between them. And if one party of them doeth wrong to the other, fight ye which doeth wrong till it return unto the ordinance of Allah. Then, if it return, make peace between them justly and act equitably. The verse here calls both sides which are fighting believers. It's acknowledging that fighting amongst Muslims can take place and offers a solution for how to end such conflicts by resorting to the Quran. The problem with that is that it's open to interpretation and therefore the two parties will likely continue to claim that the Quran supports their particular position. This can only be practically useful as a solution in the presence of Muhammad whose word would be accepted. After Muhammad, as we shall see later in this video, all hell can break loose, and this verse becomes ineffective, because there was no ultimate authority. There are numerous interpretations by Muslims as to why this verse was revealed, but it appears to be revealed following an incident of Muhammad riding a very smelly donkey. We read the following in the exegesis tafsir of Jalalain. The verse was revealed regarding a particular incident where the Prophet was riding a donkey and happened to pass by Ibn Ubay. The donkey urinated, and so Ibn Ubay held his nose, whereupon Abdullah ibn Rawaha said, By God, the smell of the donkey's urine is sweeter smelling than your musk. Fighting then ensued between the two clans, with fists, sandals, and palm branches being thrown about. Now I likened Muhammad to dictators in the past episode because of his demand for Muslims to love him more than their own parents and children. Incidentally, he claimed that those who didn't love him more than anyone else in this world is not a believer. So basically, Muhammad did take fear there to nearly every sensible Muslim today, as it's impossible to honestly love a historical figure you've never met more than your own children. Anyway, this verse is just another example of this bizarre cult following. Even Muhammad's donkey appears to be immune from criticism. How dare that man say that the donkey's urine smelt bad? So that was an example of two groups of Muslims fighting, and we will see a lot more of that later. But for now, let's return to the main type of killing that occurs. When Muslims label others non-Muslim and kill them as infidels. ISIS do this for two reasons. Either they feel that their victims never were Muslim in the first place, or left the fold of Islam because of their actions. For example, ISIS fights Shia Muslims all the time and labels them as Rafidah, which means rejectionists meaning that they rejected the legitimacy of Abu Bakr as the first caliph to succeed Muhammad. That alone to ISIS and their scholars is enough to make Shia Muslims non-Muslims in their eyes. Some basic background knowledge here. The main split between Shias and Sunnis is based on who they feel should have become the first successor to Muhammad. Sunnis believe it's Abu Bakr, and Shias believe it should have been Ali. Shias feel Ali was robbed from what was his right by Abu Bakr and Omar who schemed against Ali because of their hunger for power. So Shias have a resentment towards many of Muhammad's companions as a result of this, and Sunnis take huge offense at this. It kind of begs the question why Allah didn't allow room for just one more verse in the Quran to settle this issue outright, because this issue has resulted in so much division in his religion and the deaths of countless Muslims as a result. 
Surely there's room for two more verses in that book that would have made Islam less violent. One that tells Muslims categorically that no unarmed person can ever be killed, whoever he is. And another one on who should replace Muhammad after he dies. But instead, we get verses that are repeated for no reason throughout the Quran, and we have verses dedicated to handling fights that start after donkey piss insults. Anyway, back to the topic. One of the biggest classical scholars for Sunni Islam is a very sectarian man called Ahmed ibn Abdul Halim. He is commonly known today as Ibn Taymiyyah. But it's not just ISIS who respect his work and views. The majority of Sunni Muslims today respect him and label him as the Sheikh of Islam. In his book, As-Sarim al-Masnul ala Shatim al-Rasul, on pages 582 to 583, Ibn Taymiyyah comes up with this hadith to justify the killing of Shia Muslims. Ali said he heard the Messenger of Allah say, Do you want me to show you a way on how you can be among the people of paradise? There will be a people who appear after us, nicknamed Rafidah. If you discover them, then kill them because they are polytheists. Now, as always with all my videos, everything I say in a video will be sourced back to Islamic websites, and you can find all the links in the description box below. Now, some Sunnis may try to deny Ibn Taymiyyah's stature in the Muslim world today, so let's look at another huge classical scholar of early Islam, Imam Malik ibn Anas, the founder of one of the four main schools of jurisprudence, the Maliki school of thought, which dominates North Africa. So what did Imam Malik say about Shia Muslims, which he also labelled as Rafidis, or Rawafid? Well, we can read about what he says in the exegesis of Ibn Kathir for the Quranic verse found in chapter 48 verse 29. Now the verse is on screen and you can pause it and read it if you wish, but it basically says Muhammad and his companions are severe against infidels, but kind to their own. It then uses an allegory to describe them in a positive light and says this is to enrage the infidels. So Ibn Kathir quotes Imam Malik as saying, that he may enrage the disbelievers with them. Relying on this ayah, Imam Malik stated that the Rawafil, and by Rawafil here he means Shia Muslims, are disbelievers because they hate the companions. May Allah be pleased with them all. Malik said, the companions enrage them. And according to this ayah, he who is enraged by the companions is a disbeliever. Several scholars agreed with Malik's opinion, may Allah be pleased with them. What we've seen Ibn Taymiyyah and Malik do here is called takfir which basically means making someone a kafir, which is the Arabic word for infidel. It's basically a way for strict Muslims to try and excommunicate others who they don't see as being Muslim enough. This is something that is done more often than we think. For example, both mainstream Sunni and Shia Muslims often label the Ahmadiyya sect as infidels. Pakistan even requires all of its citizens to declare Ahmadiyyas as infidels in order to obtain a passport. Sunnis by and large also give the label of kafir to the Quran-only Muslims who reject the Hadith. Saudi Arabia prevents both the Ahmadiyyas and Quran-only Muslims from performing the Hajj because they are deemed infidels. Many sects in Islam also view the Alawites as infidels, and Alawites are predominantly found in southern Turkey and western Syria. So if we go back to the Quran in chapter 5 verse 44, it rebukes the Jews and Christians for not following all the codes of punishment commanded within their scriptures. However, it eventually reads, Therefore, fear not the people and fear me, and do not take a small price for my communications, and whoever did not judge by what Allah revealed, those are they that are the unbelievers. So if we look at this verse, it's telling believers to judge by what Allah has revealed, and those who don't are automatically infidels. This, on a literal reading, gives ISIS the green light to declare pretty much every Muslim today an infidel. Few Muslim countries in the world today abide strictly and fully with Sharia rulings like amputations, stonings, lashings, crucifixions, beheadings, etc. And very few of the Muslims living in those countries are fighting against those systems to make them Sharia-only states. Now, there is some dispute among Islamic scholars over whether that verse was aimed at Muslims or the Jews and the Christians. I won't go into all the detail on this verse, but I just wanted to mention it in passing to clarify it's not as clear-cut once we read the numerous commentaries. But back to ISIS. Someone may say that the majority of Muslims in Muslim countries don't follow Sharia laws closely, but what about those that do, like Saudi Arabia? Why does ISIS attack that government as well, even though they are practically in agreement on about 99.9% .9 of theological issues, and they practically share the same doctrine? It's simply because the Saudis have non-Muslim political allies, like the United States. ISIS reads chapter 5 verse 51, which says, O you who believe, do not take the Jews and the Christians for friends, they are friends of each other, and whoever amongst you takes them for a friend, then surely he is one of them. Surely Allah does not guide the unjust people. The verse basically rebukes Muslims who befriend Jews and Christians. Let's read the commentary of Ibn Kathir who explains this verse in a bit more detail. Allah forbids his believing servants from having Jews and Christians as friends, because they are the enemies of Islam and its people. May Allah curse them. Allah then states that they are friends of each other and he gives a warning threat to those who do this. 
He then tells us a brief story of how intolerant the second caliph of Islam, Omar, was to a Christian man who he was initially very impressed with, but drove him out of the city purely because he was a Christian. Omar ordered Abu Musa al-Ash'ari to send him on one sheet of balance the count of what he took in and what he spent. Abu Musa then had a Christian scribe and he was able to comply with Omar's demand. Omar liked what he saw and exclaimed, This scribe is proficient. Would you read in the masjid a letter that came to us from Asham? Abu Musa said, He cannot. Omar said, Is he not pure? Abu Musa said, No, but he is Christian. Abu Musa said, So Omar admonished me and poked my thigh with his finger, saying, Drive him out. Omar is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Christians entering the Islamic State. Omar is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Christians entering the Islamic States. So we can understand why ISIS can find it easy to justify labeling other Muslims non-believers when they don't follow all the rules of Sharia or when they ally with non-Muslims. But we also find a hadith that tells us the matter of labeling others infidels is not to be done lightly as it carries severe consequences for those who use it incorrectly. Allah's Messenger said, If a man says to his brother, O kafir, disbeliever, then surely one of them is such, i.e. a kafir. So it basically says when an accusation of disbelief is made by one Muslim to another, one of them at least is now an infidel. Either the accused was rightly called so, or the accuser becomes one because of his false accusation. Let's take a look at the positions of the Sunni schools of thought on takfir, when it's permissible to say a Muslim has left the faith. Remember, these four groups are Hanafi, Hanbali, Shafi'i and Maliki, and their rough geographic locations today are on the map you see. If we open up volume 13 of the Encyclopedia of Fuqah to page 229, we read for a person to be eligible to have become an infidel, they usually need to be pubescent and of a sane mind, but they differ on the details on how to deal with boys who have nearly reached puberty. The Hanafis and Hanbalis have said a boy who has yet to reach puberty can be declared an infidel and killed, as long as he is able to differentiate between women and their level of beauty. In Arabic, this term is called mumayyiz. The Hanbalis say the killing should be done after the child reaches puberty, and only if he doesn't repent by then. The Malikis say this boy must be a teen for this declaration to be valid and for the boy to be killed. But the Shafi'i school has an interesting position here. It's supposed to be the most lenient and open-minded of the bunch on this particular issue, but I'll read the quote for you to see how messed up all this is. The Shafi'i said a young boy who can distinguish the beauty of women should not be declared an infidel and killed. Instead, they agree that he is forced to remain a Muslim through beatings, threats, and imprisonment. Well, isn't that nice? That's the lenient position of what to do with a young boy who's been declared to have left Islam. So when exactly can a person be labeled an infidel according to the main schools of Sunni jurisprudence? Scholars are in agreement that whoever feels disbelief inside is not regarded and punished as an apostate until he declares his disbelief. Whoever intends to be a disbeliever in the future or was reluctant towards disbelief is regarded an infidel immediately because he voiced doubts over his possible intention to disbelieve. So a Muslim who just says that he might leave Islam is automatically considered an infidel. What else do we have? Scholars are in agreement that whoever says something blasphemous is an infidel, whether they say this to mock out of rebelliousness or through conviction, because Allah said, Was it at Allah and his communications and his messenger that you mocked? Do not make excuses. You have denied indeed after you have believed. So they go to quote chapter 9 verses 65 and 66 to show that mockery in Islam automatically drives a Muslim out of his religion. It goes on to give us another occasion when a Muslim is deemed an infidel, or if a Muslim rejects a ruling that is a fundamental part of the religion, like the obligatory nature of prayers or the prohibition of adultery. So in short, any Muslim who begins to pretend, for example, that Islam does not teach to chop off people's hands for theft, or lashing and stoning fornicators and adulterers to death, claiming fasting is not compulsory, claiming that hijabs are not compulsory, yeah, they're also declared infidels. Who else? People who swear at Allah are also deemed infidels and killed. Three of the four schools of thought will allow them to repent and they will be spared, but the Hanbali school kills anyone who swore at God whether or not he repented afterwards. We also have the following. The scholars have all agreed that whoever swore at a prophet of the prophets or ridiculed one or belittled one or attributed something to him that he should not have attributed. For example, stating they were dishonest or did not call people to God. The Hanafis and Shafi'is allow a person to repent or else that person is killed. The Malikis and Hanbalis kill them whether or not they repented. The same rule applies to angels. You can't disrespect or swear at them or else you become an infidel. Now here is where it gets really interesting, because it's going to refer to many Shia Muslims who don't like many of Muhammad's companions. 
The scholars have agreed that Muslims who call all of the companions non-Muslims become non-Muslims themselves. They also agreed that whoever accused Aisha of that which Allah had declared her innocent or denied Abu Bakr's friendship with Muhammad is an infidel because they are going against what's in the Quran. This is referring to a story that told us Aisha was once suspected of committing adultery when she had spent a night with a strange man after the caravan she was traveling in left her behind. After Muhammad was pondering whether to punish her or not and she became the talk of the town, a verse was revealed to declare that she was innocent. It continues to tell us if a Muslim declared only some of the companions as non-Muslims but accepted others, the Malikis and Hanafis view them as remaining Muslims, while the Shafi'is and Hanbalis declare them infidels. The Hanbalis, by the way, probably make up the vast majority of ISIS fighters. It also tells us throwing a Quran in a dump makes you an infidel, with the Malikis and Shafi'is including hadith books in there too. We also read the Malikis consider those who wear the clothes of infidels of different colors than those of Muslims, their belts, or displaying a cross to be an infidel. They do specify that if it's done to mock infidels then it's forbidden, but not enough to push someone out of Islam. What else? The scholars agreed that anyone who allows magic is an infidel. They go into more detail with some saying that the magician has to have intentions of producing magic in order to be killed, but Malikis say any magician is killed. Okay, that was pretty lengthy. Now we'll be moving on to the final part of the video which examines the early history of Muslims and whether or not Muslims ever fought each other. Things went downhill immediately after Muhammad died as the Muslims disagreed on who should have been the first leader after Muhammad. Many people left Islam after Abu Bakr took over, but many others remained Muslim but refused to give their zakat money to the Islamic State. Abu Bakr fought them to get that money and this authentic hadith explains this. When the Prophet died and Abu Bakr became his successor and some of the Arabs reverted to disbelief, Umar said, O oh Abu Bakr, how can you fight these people? Although Allah's Messenger said, I have been ordered to fight the people till they say, none has the right to be worshipped but Allah. And whoever said, none has the right to be worshipped but Allah, Allah will save his property and his life from me. It goes on to say, Abu Bakr said, by Allah, I will fight whoever differentiates between prayers and zakat, as zakat is the right to be taken from property, according to Allah's orders. By Allah, if they refuse to pay me even a kid they used to pay Allah's messenger, I would fight with them for withholding it. Abu Bakr began his rule in the 11th year of the Islamic calendar. 24 years later, we find ourselves during the final days of Uthman, the third caliph. From here on in, I'll be looking at Islamic history by using several sources of Islam's history, written by scholars like At-Tabari, Ibn Kathir, and Al-Dhahabi. Uthman had spent much of his reign sacking governors across the caliphate and replacing them with others, often from his own extended family, the Umayyads. Some senior Muslim figures like Amr ibn al-As and Ali, Muhammad's son-in-law and cousin, tried to advise Uthman to step down from his role. Eventually, some areas rebelled because of bad governance and wanted to overthrow Uthman as caliph. Around a thousand people from Egypt, another thousand from Kufa in Iraq, and another thousand from Basra in Iraq, all travelled towards Medina where Uthman was based. They were fed up with his rule and looking to topple him. As for the Egyptians, they yearned for Ali as caliph, while the Basrans declared Talha and the Kufans as Zubair. They all set out simultaneously. They surrounded his home and besieged it for around a month. The Egyptians had found a letter by Uthman that had been sent on its way to the governor of Egypt, telling him to execute the rebels once they were home. They obviously didn't like what they found because Uthman had promised to address all their grievances. The Egyptians returned to Uthman after having departed from him because a slave of his riding one of his camels overtook them carrying a letter to the governor of Egypt with orders to kill some of them and crucify others. When they came back to Uthman they said, This is your slave. He said, My slave went without my knowledge. They said, It is your camel. He responded, He took it from the house without my orders. They said, This is your seal. It was forged, he said. Kind of sounds like Uthman was probably making up excuses on the spot after getting caught red-handed. He eventually even lost the support of the people in his own city and everyone around him was getting fed up of him and his preferential treatment to close relatives. We then read on page 190 of Tabari volume 15 that Abu Bakr's son Muhammad led the charge into Uthman's home to kill him. Muhammad bin Abi Bakr came with 13 men and went up to Uthman. He seized his beard and shook it until I heard his teeth chattering. Muhammad bin Abi Bakr said, Muawiyah was no help to you, nor was Ibn Amin, nor your letters. Uthman said, let go of my beard, son of my brother, let go of my beard. Then I saw Ibn Abi Bakr signaling with his eye to one of the rebels. He came over to him with a broad iron-headed arrow and stabbed him in the head with it. I, that is Ibn An, asked, then what happened? Wathab replied, they gathered round him and killed him. This is one account and other accounts offer some variations to the killing, but it's crystal clear that he was killed at the hands of Muslims. The killing of Uthman created huge problems for his successor Ali. 
Ali, who relocated the Islamic State's capital from Medina in modern-day Saudi Arabia to the city of Kufa in Iraq, faced a rebellion by a number of prominent Muslim figures. Muawiyah, Uthman's relative, was the powerful governor of Damascus, and he refused to recognize Ali as caliph. Many others who began to oppose Ali felt he wasn't doing enough to find and punish Uthman's killers. Which leads us on to the next internal Muslim fight, the Battle of the Camel. Aisha, Muhammad's child bride, who was an adult at this time, had an issue with Ali. This was likely caused by Ali's reluctance to accept her father, Abu Bakr, as the first caliph. She brought along two senior companions called Talha and Azubair, and all three decided they wanted to avenge Uthman's death. So they took a force of an estimated 30,000 fighters from Medina to Basra. Ali, who was the new caliph, met them with a force of around 20,000 fighters. Many Sunni Muslims today try to deny that Aisha had the intention to fight Ali, and they claim that the whole battle was just one big misunderstanding. But the logic behind that proposition is fairly poor. Anyway, the incredible thing here is that Muhammad in an authentic hadith had named 10 people who were guaranteed heaven. These 10 included Ali, but it also included two of the leaders of the opposing side in this battle, Talha and Zubair. The Messenger of Allah said, Abu Bakr is in paradise, Umar is in paradise, Uthman is in paradise, Ali is in paradise. Talha is in paradise, as Zubair is in paradise, and so on. So we have Muslims who are guaranteed heaven fighting another Muslim who is also guaranteed heaven. This makes it very difficult for the Muslims to claim that one group were not real Muslims. Then in another authentic hadith, Muhammad says, Allah's Messenger said, when two Muslims confront each other with their swords, both the slayer and the slain are doomed to hellfire. So which is it, Muhammad? Are these people going to heaven or hell? One narration mentions them as people of paradise by name, but then he also tells us that Muslims who fight each other are all going to hell. But these same people fought each other. Anyway, Ali's forces eventually won the battle and he was pretty angry at Aisha, which is why Shia Muslims today hate her. On page 127 of volume 16 of Tabari's history, we read about Aisha's brother Muhammad, who was actually on Ali's side in the battle against his own sister. But seeing her as the battle drew down, he took her to a secure place. Muhammad bin Abi Bakr carried Aisha away and erected a large tent over her. Ali came and stood in front of her and said, You roused the people, and they became excited. You stirred up discord among them, such that some killed others. And he went on at length. Aisha replied, Ibn Abi Talib, you have gained your victory. Give me an honorable pardon. Now, if it was all a big misunderstanding, as many Sunnis claim, then why would there be a need for such a conversation between Ali and Aisha? Why would he accuse her of stirring up discord? Why would she even ask for a pardon? Now, what was the death toll here? Was it five or six people, as you would expect from a basic misunderstanding or a mix-up? No. The number of people killed in the Battle of Camel was between, wait for it, 10,000 and 15,000 Muslims who killed each other. Among the dead were Talha and Zubair on Aisha's side, the two who had been promised paradise. So whoever says killing other Muslims means someone isn't a Muslim, they are in fact saying that Muhammad's wife Aisha, the fourth caliph Ali, Talha and Zubair, among a whole host of Muhammad's early companions, were not Muslims because they all participated at the Battle of the Camel. The infighting did not end there. Only a year later, Ali mobilizes forces against an openly rebellious governor in Damascus who continued to undermine and threaten him. Their forces meet at a place called Safin, which is present-day Raqqa in Syria. Both sides had a force of around 100,000 fighters each. Fighting left around 70,000 Muslims dead. 45,000 from Muawiyah's side and 25,000 from Ali's side. The death toll for this is found in volume 3, page 545 of Imam Dhahabi's books on the history of Islam. After 70,000 dead, both camps believed there was a stalemate that needed to be resolved by arbitration. Ali and Muawiyah agreed to this and the fighting ended. But the drama doesn't end there as a large part of Ali's forces, around 12,000, felt Ali was wrong in agreeing to what was a fragile ceasefire and they rebelled. They split off from Ali's camp and called themselves Ashurat. All their opponents called them Khawarij, or in English, Kharijites. The name their opponents gave them has stuck with them, given that very few of the Shurat are around today. They're generally confined to the country of Oman, under the Ibadi sect which was born out of this movement. Back when they rebelled against Ali, they felt they were the best Muslims, and condemned Ali for allowing people to solve the crisis between him and Muawiyah through arbitration, instead of going back to the Quran. Their main slogan was, Governance is for Allah alone. Ali and his allies managed to persuade some of them to return to his side after negotiations, but most were adamant that Ali had left Islam through his actions and needed to be killed. 
Ali eventually gathered a large army of tens of thousands and attacked the most hardcore remnants who were completely massacred, leaving at least several hundred dead. The Khawarij did eventually get their revenge on Ali when they assassinated him using a poisoned sword, but one of the most famous internal battles in early Islamic history is that of Karbala. We already heard about the battle between Ali and Muawiyah where thousands upon thousands died. Well, Karbala pitted both their children against each other. Yazid, Muawiyah's son, sent an army as the Caliph to fight Ali's son Hussein. That fight was very one-sided and Yazid killed Hussein, who was also Muhammad's grandson, and much of his immediate family at this battle. So in example after example after example, we see instances where Muslims fought each other time and time again. As we have seen, there is plenty of reason to see that fighting and killing other Muslims can be justified using Islam's sources and the concept of takfir, which is to label another Muslim an infidel. We have an entire chapter in the Quran that warns Muhammad and Muslims of hypocrites who lie within the community. Such rhetoric inevitably led to an atmosphere of deep suspicion among Muslims. The Quran provides a verse on how Muslim infighting should be dealt with, referring to both sides as believers. Some of the biggest scholars in Islam have specifically mentioned Shia Muslims as non-believers with Ibn Taymiyyah coming up with a narration by Muhammad that allegedly foresees their appearance and tells other Muslims to kill them. The founder of the Maliki school of thought in Sunni Islam also claims Shias are infidels. The Malikis and the other three Sunni schools of thought use the concept of takfir to label Muslims who don't live up to their standards as infidels. These include people who voice doubts about Islam being the truth, saying anything regarded blasphemous, even if it's done as a joke, mocking any prophets, mocking the angels, rejecting things in Islam that have a consensus, like the fact that there are five daily prayers, fasting, the hajj, wearing the hijab, eating halal, avoiding alcohol, are all obligatory. If someone claims any of them are not, they are an infidel. Disputing the death penalty for apostates, disputing the punishments like cutting the hand of a thief and stoning the adulterer, yep, all mean you are disputing an issue with classical scholarly consensus and therefore you become an infidel. Those Sunni schools all agreed that those who claim Muhammad's companions were not Muslims because of their greed over power are also infidels. We also had plenty of examples from early Islamic history of Muslims fighting and killing other Muslims. The first caliph, Abu Bakr, found many Muslims unwilling to pay zakat to the Islamic State and he declared war on many Muslims as a result. Then we read that the third caliph of Uthman annoys Muslims by ruling with a degree of nepotism and bringing in his relatives to powerful positions and not doing much to fix the problems that were a result of bad governance. Eventually, Muslims besiege his home for around a month and a group led by Abu Bakr's son Muhammad, at least according to some major sources, goes in and kills the caliph. This leaves his successor Ali facing a revolt because he was viewed as not doing much to try and find Uthman's killers and hold them to account. Muhammad's widowed wife Aisha leads an army into battle against Ali's forces in Basra. The battle leaves between 10 and 15,000 Muslims dead as a result of the infighting. Only a year later, Ali faces a revolt from the governor in Damascus who is related to Uthman. That battle leaves around 70,000 Muslims dead and ends in an unresolved stalemate that led to a fragile ceasefire. The agreement to end fighting led to a revolt by thousands of Ali's fighters who eventually got massacred by Ali at Nahrawan near Baghdad. A few hundred to around a thousand died in that battle. This group that was massacred at Nahrawan eventually managed to assassinate Ali in revenge. We also know of the infamous Battle of Karbala, where Ali's son and his relatives were killed by the Muslim army as he claimed the right to lead the caliphate. This battle is what Shias today remember every year in Ashura, when they beat themselves and cut themselves. All this evidence simply leaves no room whatsoever for the claim that ISIS killing Muslims cancels out the fact that they abide by Islamic laws and take lessons from Islam's early history. So we finally reach the end of this mammoth episode. Next time I'll be concluding this series that compares Islamic State's actions to Islamic sources when I'll take a look at their practice of destroying artifacts and shrines. Until then, ma'as salama. 